start. So welcome to tonight's talk. Uh, my, my name, if you, if you don't know me, is Adam Simon. I've got Barbara, my wife here, who's hiding at the moment. And um, I'm the leader of the lay community of St. Benedict, also a parishioner of Waveridge in Surrey. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth in a series of talks to celebrate 50 years of the founding of the lay community of St. Benedict, which was founded by the monks of Worth Abbey in 1971. It's lovely to see Father Aidan here with us tonight. And it might be Father Gabriel, I'm not sure. No, but it's, it's Father, um, I can see just there. Um, and um, at that time, the um, Archbishop uh, Michael Bowen was in fact the Bishop of Arundel of, and Brighton. And tonight we're delighted to welcome his successor, Bishop Richard Moff, Bishop of Arundel and Brighton. We're also very pleased tonight to welcome monks and nuns of other Benedictine houses who are listening either on the Zoom or online on YouTube. Um, and I would particularly like to welcome Father Martin Birrell, uh, who is the Oblate Master of Pluskerton uh, Abbey. And he will be joining us a little bit later but he is in fact Bishop Richard's uh, oblate master. Um, and there will be some oblates also from Pluskerton who will be joining us tonight. Um, and I would also like to welcome any priests and parishioners from the Diocese of Arundel and Brighton who've joined us tonight. It's great that you could be with us and thank you to the Diocese for publicizing tonight's event. So now, uh, as with the previous talks, I'm going to hand you over to Mike Woodward, who is going to introduce Bishop Richard and facilitate the Q&A session afterwards. So over to you, Mike. Thank you, Adam. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Bishop Richard Moth this evening from his very own Diocese of Arundel and Brighton. And if this catches on if this catches on with Adam, I look forward to the possibility of being with Esther Duvald in Oxford and perhaps even with Jim Forrest in the Netherlands in future months. Bishop Richard has a long-standing connection with Worth Abbey, having frequented the evenings provided by the community at the monastery in East Dulwich uh, as a young priest in the early 1980s. However, he developed an affinity with Plus Garden Abbey not far from Inverness. This is clearly a long way from Arundel. In fact, to go from A to P, as it were, is 620 miles and likely to take 11 hours. However, but Richard was born in Zambia, studied in Canada, and as a TA chaplain and later Bishop of the Forces, he's well used to movement and manoeuvres as part of his ministry. It will, be, it will be fascinating to hear how Bishop Richard's powerfully kinetic side it is nourished by St. Benedict, who is superficially at least appears to stand for not going anywhere very much. And I hope also to hear how Richard came to put his trust in horses. So without any more ado, over to you, Bishop Richard. Michael and Adam, thank you for your very kind welcome. Um, Father Martin, who Adam mentioned, is just about halfway through Compline at the moment at Pluskerton. So Compline takes place at eight o'clock, so uh, he'll be, be joining us uh, after, after night prayer up there. Uh, let's just begin with a, with a little prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, we thank you for calling us together. We thank you for all your gifts to us, especially those we receive through our association with um, Benedictine houses. We ask you to make us open to the promptings of your spirit, that everything we do may begin with your inspiration, continue with your help, and reach perfection under your guidance. For you are Lord forever and ever. Amen. 
St. Benedict, pray for us, and St. Scholastica, pray for us. So, um, well, dear brothers and sisters, thank you for inviting me to speak uh, this evening as part of your great Jubilee celebrations. Um, I'd like to congratulate you as the community on all that you are doing, and more importantly, all that you are being in your following of the gospel in the light of the rule of our holy father saint benedict now i'm very conscious of the excellent speakers who have addressed you on recent occasions uh, so it's a little daunting to find myself in such exalted company thank you in advance for your patience um, i was actually at worth earlier today uh, confirmations for um, the um, students from the school um, and it was uh, as always lovely to be there so it's great to see Worth in Brighton as it were with us this evening give you a little wave um, and um, as has been mentioned I've known Worth on and off for quite a while in fact seeing Father Aidan there I remember uh, when the community started um, the the Dulwich experience, as it were, I was a curate uh, in those days, an assistant priest in a nearby parish, um, and went over to be there for the official opening and and subsequent visits as well. So um, it's lovely to be with you this evening. Now Adam has asked me to offer a few thoughts regarding my own journey and experience of the vocation for it is a vocation, to be an oblate, and specifically of the Benedictine community at Pluscan and Abbey in Scotland. You might be wondering, why be an oblate of a monastery that is as far from home as it is possible to be in the British Isles? A bit crackers, you might think, a little bit zany. Well, it happened like this. Um, a fellow student at St John's Seminary in Wanosh, where I was in formation for priesthood for the Diocese of Southwark, had heard of this community in the north. And this led to a little group of four of us deciding to go and see what it was all about. And we hired a car and headed to Scotland in the Easter holidays in 19. 78. Um, now in those days it was a very long journey. The A9 had not been built, the road that runs from kind of Perth really up to Inverness, that didn't exist. Um, and the A1 wasn't as fast as it is today. So we set out, the four of us in this hired, those of you who can remember them, Triumph Dolomite. Um, and headed to Ampleforth, where we camped for a night in a field. And then we drove from there to the Cistercian Monastery at Nunraw, a little bit south of Edinburgh, and spent a night in their, um, let we, shall we say, basic guest house. We'll leave it at that, I think. Then we moved, we, we drove from there up to Loch Ness, where we pitched a tent again, and then the next day arrived at Pluscan and Abbey. Um, so a long old journey. When we got to Pluscan, there was snow on the ground, quite a lot of it, and the guest house in those days uh, was housed in an old RAF barrack hut at the bottom of the drive with no heating really to speak of and um there were some what shall i call them conveniences at one end of this hut um on there was a sign on the door of one of them which read der trap ist kaput so it was all a little bit basic really um the monastery too was not in the state it is now the chancel of the abbey had no roof a medieval building. The choir in those days was situated partly under a temporary roof. And getting up for vigils and lords, which 
begins at 4.30 in the morning, was a bit of a challenge. If I dig out my old photographs of the visit, which I'm not going to share on the screen, don't worry. Um, we looked, the four of us looked rather like Michelin men with pullovers under cassocks in an effort to keep warm. So you might be thinking, well, why on earth do that? That's just uncomfortable and inconvenient and penitential. Um, there was something of the challenge about it. It was certainly very different. But I think more importantly, and I, as I was putting these thoughts together, I kind of cast my mind back to that very first visit. And what I encountered was a very welcoming community of men striving to live the monastic life in a, a spirit of really great simplicity, I would say, while working very hard to complete the restoration of a medieval building. St. Benedict writes in his rule, all guests who present themselves are to be welcomed as Christ. And in the community's very simple way at that time, that welcome was there in abundance. As seminary students, we were invited to join the community in choir. We were invited to join the brothers with some of their work. And we enjoyed the simple and hearty, if sometimes rather odd, food. Um, it's less common these days, but in those days, vegetables usually arrive disconnected from other parts of the meal. And uh, fruit appeared mixed in with rice pudding and there was porridge for dinner. So it was all a little bit on the rustic side. And I suppose there was something in that that, that appealed in, in a sort of romantic sort of way. Your vision of the, you know, monks getting up early in the morning, singing Gregorian chant, it was the, the liturgies in Latin, new rites, not old rite, new rites, but um, uh, they've, they've retained Latin, um, simple food, all that sort of stuff medieval buildings, there was a certain, you, you might think a rather rather romantic attraction to the whole thing. A beautiful site, very quiet, away from the town, um, surrounded by woods and trees and farmland and all that sort of thing. Um, but I came away from the visit marked by something other than uh, the kind of romantic vision of what it is to be a monk. Um, the experience of an observant community putting every effort into the liturgy, using the same psalm scheme that Benedict lays down in the rule, so the 150 psalms in a week, um, a lot of silence, a little bit of rigour about things, and a real sense of peace, balance, and the rhythm of life. The motto of Pluscott and Abbey is, in locus iste, Darbo Parchem, in this place I will give peace. And I came away from there with a real sense of peace. So, having come south and warmed up again, um, I determined to return and did so that same summer. And perhaps rather quickly, you might think. Uh, was received as a novice oblate. Now, a lot of people have asked me, did I have a vocation ever, or did I ever think about the vocation to be a monk? <laughs> I think, excuse me laughing, but I have wonderful memories of, of some of members of the community. I think some of the brothers thought this might be a possibility. Brother Mungo, now dead, who worked with Brother Adrian, who died a couple of years ago. Uh, the two of them worked in the garden. And Brother Mungo used to give me very large jars, of, kilner jars of homemade jam to take home to my mother. I think he figured that if I kept feeding my mother jam, she wouldn't mind if I joined the community um, and head north for good. However, um, God was not, it seemed, calling me to be a monk. But the call to be an oblate 
was very strong. The novice master at Plus Goodin in those days was Father Morris Deegan. He had served in the fire brigade in Liverpool during the Blitz, and his response to all that he had experienced was to become a monk. I remember him saying to me, um, after all I experienced in the war, there was only one valid response, and that was to uh, enter monastic life and live a life of, of prayer after all his experience. He wrote to me often during that year, and when I visited, he would leave notes under my plate at meals, calling me to walk with him in the afternoon. I'll be honest with you, I dreaded those walks. I never really understood what he was going on about. But there was a spirit of devotion in him, especially to our Blessed Lady, and of wholehearted giving to the person of Christ. Pretty good lessons to learn. Interestingly, Father Morris, um, he started writing a commentary on the rule. And he had a very interesting approach. He took the Latin text of the rule and started looking up the etymology of every individual word. Now, had he completed this work, it would have been stunning. Um, but uh, but he, 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 he got halfway through the prologue uh, and I think ran out of energy. Um, but he taped it, and I've still got somewhere in a cupboard, um, old fashioned cassette tapes with this word by word commentary on the rule. Conversations with him made it pretty clear to me and it seemed to Father Morris that ablation was the right step to take. And Abbot Alfred received my ablation on the 24th of July, 1979 during Vespers. I remember, and I can still recall that moment, a great sense of feeling at home in this place. In this place, I will give peace. I took the name Bruno as my oblate name because I'd also come to know the Carthusians at Parkminster in our own diocese in A&B uh, by that time. And I was attracted by this saint of silence. This will surprise people in Arundel and Brighton because they know I can't stop talking. Um, but I was attracted by this saint of silence. And interestingly, the community were delighted because their own father Bruno had only very recently died. So they felt, and I remember them telling me this, we've got a new Bruno. Now being an oblate is a vocation. What's this vocation about? It's the call to be part of a monastic family and a particular monastic family. An oblate makes his or her ablation to the abbot, just as a monk or a nun makes their profession to their abbot or abbess. You're tied to that monastery. The Lord calls all of us to be his, and he calls us to be his in the way that is right for us. I'm sure you probably will experience something of that. The response to his call is what enables us to be the people we are meant to be. And I believe very firmly that being an oblate is part of who I am meant to be. I would not be me without it. I'd be something else. Now, this does not mean I'm a, I'm a good oblate. I'm not pretending I'm a good oblate at all, whatever being a good oblate is, but I do try. Now, I've spoken about hospitality, welcome, and about liturgy. While I do love Gregorian chant and the singing of the Divine Office, Pluskadon also has had a part in teaching me that care in the celebration of the liturgy, in that way of dignified simplicity, is a good thing. The other, the other element that for me is key here is balance. 
This is something of which I speak quite often. Again, it doesn't mean that I live it very well, but there is a call to try to live a balanced life. The rhythm of prayer and work that is so very evident at Pluscadon and attempting to live something of that balance as a priest and bishop is, I believe, an important witness, even though I fail a good deal. Now, God has called me to be an oblate of Pluscan and not somewhere else, even though it's miles away from anywhere. This is stability for the oblate. Stability is one of the uh, monastic vows, and for the oblate, that stability is expressed through uh, membership of your community. It's expressed in everyday life through the reading of the rule each day. I'm sure many of you do exactly that. Um, and I know because I've written the dates down the margin of my copy of the rule that I'm reading the same piece of rule every day that the my brothers in community, as it were, um, are, are, are saying as well. I'm united with them in that. And of course, in the divine office and the celebration of mass. Pluscadon has those words at the end of office, um, Divinum auxiliam maniat semper abiscum, the response is et cum fratribus nostris absentibus. In English, may the divine assistance remain always with us and with our absent brethren. Um, so over the years I've developed the habit, um, certainly when I'm saying office on my own, um, of adding those words on at the end. The community is praying for me my, that, and with our absent brothers, and I am praying for them. So there is a union in prayer here as well. Aside from my annual visit, sometimes in the winter, got snowed in once when I was Bishop of the Forces, um, sometimes in the summer, um, I've been privileged to make two retreats there at especially significant moments in my life before ordination to priesthood and before my ordination as a bishop. I shared my priesthood ordination retreat with the present abbot Anselm and also the previous ab abbot Hugh, who is now the Bishop of Aberdeen. These were times of silence. I was given work to do that I could do without disturbing anybody and reflection uh, in and with the community. Now, over these 40 something years, it's become possible to get there more quickly. I now do the drive in one day, leaving Sussex at three and with a bit of luck with the traffic and maybe one short stop north of Perth, I can be at the monastery for Vespers. I've come to know the community fairly well too. I know most of the men buried in the cemetery. Praying there when I visit brings memories of those I've known and the things they have taught me. Humour, devotion, perseverance, faithfulness, vision and sense of purpose. But also struggle. The rosy tinted images of first visits give way to something more real and perhaps a bit more ordinary too. One thinks of those monks who faced ill health, questioned their faith, suffered from acedia, bad temper, tiredness. These are the struggles that we all face in one way or another you and I face them too, but they can be amplified sometimes in community life where little problems can grow greater than perhaps they really are. Yet I find a community of men who've answered the call so that, as Benedict puts it at the end of the prologue, faithfully observing his teaching in the monastery until death, they shall through patience share in the sufferings of Christ and deserve also to share in his kingdom. Now that call 
to be faithful, to observe his teaching, um, to share in the kingdom. That's there for every one of us in a different context, it's true. But the monastic community is an example of that perseverance, that sharing in the struggle. To be allowed, through the Lord's love, to be a little closer to this life is a great source of encouragement, sustenance and shared prayer. It's a place one might be brave enough to call home. In locus iste darbo parchem, in this place I will give peace. Now it may seem to you that I see ablation as a way of taking from the community. What of giving back? That's more difficult to quantify. I've represented the monastery at International Oblate Conference in Rome, given retreats to Oblates at Pluscadon and nationally, and even once given the community their own retreat. I've got a photograph of the community at that retreat on the wall of my office. Um, I remember Hugh was the abbot at the time and he asked me several times if I would do it. And I said, I can't possibly give a retreat to you lot. And after a year or two, I said, well, okay, I'll do it, but give me a theme. And the then prior, Brother Morris said, we don't need a theme. We just need a few jokes. Um, so anyway, I, pre I, pre I preached the retreat on the letters of John. I hope Morris wasn't too disappointed. Uh, I hope um, mine, mine read it was rather, not Morris. I hope mine read wasn't too disappointed. Um, maybe you would need to ask the community at Pluscadon if this particular oblate um, has done much for them. Probably not. But may I, however, go back to something I said at the beginning about you, about the lay community of St. Benedict. It's not so much about doing, it's about being. And if my being an oblate brings some blessing to a monastic community and to its community of oblates, that's a result of God's grace, not because I do things. For everything we have, and I know you're celebrating this in this Jubilee year, everything we have is gift. And ablation has been and is, uh, for me, all gift. Um, and I hope when the time comes, uh, there will still be place a place for me, uh, or what's left of me, uh, in the cemetery at Pluskin and Abbey. So thank you for bearing with my witterings. Um, I'm going to hand over to Michael now, who's going to direct questions and stuff. I was, I, I was given half an hour and I've been just half, we're just a half eight, so we're kind of on time. Thank you very much, Bishop Richard. That was, that was uh, perfectly timed. Thank you very much. Um, fascinating to hear about Pluscadon. Okay, um, we have time then for some questions now. Um, they can be contributed via the chat and um, I'll, I'll probably invite you to make your question uh, in person. We got one from Adam to kick us off. So Adam, please, would you? Bishop Richard, thank oh, you. Sorry, let me find you, there you are, yes. Right. <laughs> so Bishop Richard, thank you so much for that talk and thank you for sharing this personal journey. It's really fascinating to hear about it and, um, and to know how much being an oblate has meant throughout your life. And it's really a wonderful sort of revelation to share that with us. And for all of us who are uh, lay uh, people following uh, the Benedictine way, it's really interesting to hear about uh, being an oblate, which is a, a different way of doing that. But my question is really, uh, in your vocation as a priest and in your vocation now as a bishop, um, how would you say that uh, being an oblate has, has impacted your own 
personal mission as a priest and as a bishop? Um, how do you think it's impacted by <laughs> Does he naughtily? Um, well, a number of, I think a lot of people in Arundel and Brighton know because I give talks about it to our young people and I've given a few retreats around the place on it now. Um, a very key thing for me, and I didn't mention this in the talk because, um, uh, you know, I'm leaving space for questions and I've spoken about it quite a bit before and a lot of you have heard what I've said. But a, a very key thing for me that's come out of my, my, my Benedictine experience, if you like, is the practice of Lexio Divina. Um, I think that's key, um, one of the key things, um, that continual effort, attempt, I won't make it any grander than that, but a continual effort and attempt uh, to return uh, often daily to uh, the scriptures. I think I've learned that from Pluskadon really. Um, to spend time with the Lord in his word um, I think that's one of the great gifts that, that it's given me. Um, it, it's, and I, I, I suspect a lot of you feel the same way. It's a, the, the rule is a kind of touchstone. We've got the gospel and you might say, well, we don't need anything else. We've got the gospel. Um, but for many of us, and for, certainly for those of you joining in this session this evening, um, there is something about the rule of St. Benedict, which maybe we can't explain very well, but it provides us with a lens um, through, which we can, we, through which we can see life. I don't, think we see the, we, I don't think we so much see the gospel through the lens of St. Benedict. I think we're standing on the other side of it, as it were, and we have the gospel and we look at all that the Lord throws in front of us through this lens hmm. so we're coming from the place of the eucharist from the word of god from the church's teaching from our life experience whatever whatever we carry with us um, and the rule acts as a kind of a, of a lens through which we can we can see things and view things perhaps a, a little more clearly in a, in a more balanced way going back to this thing of balance um, so, you know, that's a bit vague. I mean, there are other there are other aspects of it. Um, just thinking about what Benedict says about listening to people of every age, mm. calling the young to counsel as well as the old. Mm. You know, some of those things that are quite practical when you're in, involved in the governance of the church. Mm. You know, there's some quite practical stuff in there too. Um, I, when, when I was um, when I when I was first ordained a priest, there's a you've all heard of Jean Vianney, the Curé of Ars, mm. and I, I set myself when I was first ordained to try and read his biography by Trochu every year, and I got very depressed because <laughs> well not very depressed but I got a bit cheesed off with it because I realised that. I could never be Jean Vianney. I wasn't going to live on rotting potatoes, thank you very much. Um, and it was all a little bit too much somehow. Um, you've also got other th writings spring to mind about bishops. Pope St. Gregory the Great, in his book, The Pastoral Care, tells you how to be a bishop. And you think, oh, failed at the first hurdle. Oh, I'm a disaster. You know, that's probably true, actually, but... You know, you just think, no, like, this is just too much. Um, even St. Bernard, I, I, I took St. Bernard's writing on bishops on retreat a while ago, and that, that didn't cheer me much either. Um, but when you look at, when you, when you take the rule, it's a very, okay, it was written for its age, and, we, you know, we don't beat boys anymore, all that sort of stuff that's in there for boys who are disobedient and all those things. Um, but um, there's a great humanity to it. It's actually doable. Mm. There's nothing in the rule really that's so frightening that you'd run a mile from it. At least I don't find it so. Mm. The Benedictine monks who are with us, I I'm sure would agree. Um, 
it's this it's this balance thing. You think mm-hmm. no, actually, it's so beautifully put. It's challenging, but neither does it discourage. Mm-hmm. And I think there's something. Sorry, I've spoken for too long in answer to one question, but I think that's a key thing for me in Benedict. Thank you, thank you. Very good answer. Uh, Mary Stocker has a question. Hello, Bishop Richard. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Um, I think as lay Benedictines, one of the things that many of us struggle with is almost the conflict between our commitment to our Benedictine community and our commitment to our parishes. Um, And often at particular times of the year, and I'm thinking of Easter, where we Um, are wanting to be with our Benedictine community but feel guilty because that's pulling us out of our parishes Um, and I'm sure you must have experienced a little bit of that with your commitment to your oblate community versus your commitment to your diocese. We've certainly lost some community members because they have rightly so got very involved in their parishes and feel they can't therefore commit to our community because it's taking them away from the parish. And I didn't know if you had any reflection on that balance and um, that... Yes, but we're back to balance again. Yeah. Two good things, yeah. yeah. Now, Mary, thank you for your question. It's a, it's a, it's a good one. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, the problem of... Just to take one example, do I spend... Easter with my Benedictine community or in my diocese, that's a no brainer. There's only one place I ever can be. And that's always been the same through priesthood. You can't, you know, perhaps it's easier for those of us with these around our necks because we know our first responsibility is to a parish or to, you know, when I was Bishop of the Forces, the bishopric, wherever I happen to be. Um, I remember us going off to Germany to celebrate Easter with the boys and girls over there, wherever it was. Or now, that, that's not a question that I would ha- ever have to grapple with, ever. Um, it's also the case that, that for um, different monasteries expect have different expectations of their oblates. Um, so I've given oblate retreats in two or three of them now, I think over the years, in one of one Benedictine house, where they've just made the conscious decision to have no more oblates than they have members in the community. So that's an interesting thought. You say it's a community of women. So you think, well, we've got 14, I think it's about 14 women in the community. We'll have 14 oblates, we'll have one each. <laughs> um, and I think, I think they made that decision so that they wouldn't find themselves swamped with oblates. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the things that they do uh, after Easter is they they expect their oblates to go on retreat there together for a week. And then those who can stay on for a second week and help out with practical stuff around the house, a bit of painting, a bit of gardening, whatever. Um, so that's, that's the way one, one monastery does it. Um, Another monastery, again, where I've sort of visited a few times to do with, with oblate stuff, um, they have a, 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 a really highly developed system of retreats and newsletters. Um, we don't do that at Pluscadon. Maybe it's because it's so remote that the community know a lot of us can't get there very often. There's a tradition that the Glasgow oblates go for a week in August. Um, but um, what, what Pluscadon's done is they've set up little chapters around the place so that people who are living locally, Glasgow, Edinburgh, London, can meet locally. I've never managed to get to one. Never, not once. Um, but the way the Pluscadon model is, it's very, how can I put it? It's rather gentle on the expectation on the oblate. Um, so that's not a problem. It's not a problem to me. And for a few years, I didn't get there very often. I was studying in Canada, as been mentioned, for two years. And those t- the two years I was in Canada, I just couldn't get there. Um, so uh, and we all have times in our lives 
when we, we face those kinds of issues. I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, so the oblate thing, the way it's lived out varies quite a bit. I've had some connections with um, a Cistercian house in Germany. Cistercians don't have oblates, they have things called lay Cistercians, but they're tied to monasteries rather like oblates are. Um, and um, again, they do it rather differently. The expectations vary quite a bit. Um, so for me personally, the question you've raised has never been a problem. I know that there are some people, particularly in Scotland, who will head for Pluscadon for big events um, for, for Easter. They run a series of Pentecost lectures every year, which people attend, not, not oblates, anybody can go. They usually, well, these days they're done rather like this and they often end up in a book. Um, so, you know, there's lots of different ways that ablation is done really and for me your problem has never never been there um, but I can understand that it is and I would I would always say to people well think of all the wonderful gifts that being a, as for you members of the lay community St Benedict all those lovely gifts you receive and ask yourself how you can bring them into your parish life so that you're benefiting the parish from your Benedictine experience. And I know that happens. I know it does. Um, so keep doing all that you're doing in that regard, because I do, I do see some two way traffic here. It's not all one way. Um, and so, so stick at it, but they're, they're, you're, we're always going to have those. I want to be somewhere and I've got to be somewhere else, whichever way round it is. It's life, I think, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, um, perhaps you could just um, answer a question from Mark Rema. Is there, is there anything in the rule that is speaking to you in a particular way at the moment? Oh, my word. Well, um, huh. I suppose as a bishop, um, what Benedict has to say about being a good abbot is come crosses my mind quite frequently. Um, as I say, I, you know, um, the Lord will judge uh, as to how uh, what kind of a fist I'm making of the whole thing. Um, but those words are there often as a bit of a um, examination of conscience, if you like. Uh, when it comes to what Benedict has to say about the, 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 the way an abbot operates. There, there's, a, there's a piece also in, in the prologue that I re have recourse to a great deal um, in, um, in speaking about the call to others. And I find I use this an awful lot. And it's that wonderful bit um, in the prologue where Benedict gives the image of God coming into the busy marketplace mm. and looking for you. Uh, and, and Benedict says, if you want, let me just, I've got the rule here, hang on a minute. Let me, let me get it right. Um, here it is. Um, seeking his workmen in a multitude of people. So that sense of, his workmen, we're, we're, we're at stuff. Seeking his workmen in a multitude of people, the Lord calls out to him and lifts his voice. Is there anyone here who yearns for life and desires to see good days? If you hear this and your answer is, I do, God then directs these words to you. If you desire true and eternal life, then you get st stuff from the commandments. Keep your tongue from vicious talk and your lips from deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Let peace be your quest and aim. Once you have done this, my eyes will be upon you and my ears will listen for your prayers. And even before you ask me, I will say to you, here I am. Uh, and that is the most wonderful image to me. 
that in the busyness of our lives, God steps into that space, if you like, and looks for us in all the busyness. And before we've even asked him the question, he says, I'm here. Um, I'm calling to you. Come and come and come and find good days, which you can only find in relationship with me. And I, I make reference to that takes an awful lot. Mm. It's a fantastic, mm. it's an image for our modern day. Yeah. This crazy frenetic lives that we lead and into all this craziness, God steps and says, hang on a minute. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Look this way, you know? Mm. Yeah. Very good. Yes. Thank you. I've got I've got one slightly gentler question for you from from, from Gerard, who often asks very good questions. Um, do you like ice cream? Do I like? Oh yes. Right. Adam will tell you. Adam and Barbara but probably know this. When we go on pilgrimage to Lourdes, no pilgrimage to Lourdes is valid without a daily ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> it's invalid. It's not a proper pilgrimage if I haven't had an ice cream every day. Right. And. And I think Adam's uh, uh, keen to ask you another one as well. Obviously. Yes, well, I didn't want to, to hog the time, but I would love to ask another question. In fact, it's prompted, uh, Bishop Richard, by what you said about balance and the balanced life. And I don't know if you're aware, but for the last 18 months, we've been running a project called the Balanced Life Project. And the object of it is to reach out to young people and to make the values... Um, of the rule of St. Benedict um, come alive to young people and to reimagine it really for the 21st century. Um, so, so my question for you is this, Bishop Richard, is, is there any particular aspects of the rule which you think are very attractive uh, to young people on the one hand and which uh, on the other hand uh, are important and helpful to young people in the situation in which they find themselves today. St. Benedict. Um, yeah, I was thinking that in the wake of, partly in the wake of COVID, one of the things that Benedict gives us, one of his gifts, is to do with pace and time. So it's about allowing space, I think, um, giving, allowing your pace to slow. And I think a lot of people at the moment, right across society, are experiencing a little bit of what it is for your pace to slow down. Now, I think that's an opportunity for us because we can say, well, what fills that space? You know, um, and if what fills the space is an openness to the presence of God, a bit of time for the scripture, a little bit of time for reflection and prayer, um, then, you know, great. So I think that's one of the things we've got. Um, I think there's a lot of people have had experiences uh, in all sorts of ways in recent times of good works. Um, a lot of communities doing fantastic things for folk around them people being on the receiving end of good works. And Benedict has a lot to say about that. Um, I think that going back to the part of the theme of my little offering, this uh, in this place I will find peace, you know, that's tied up as well with being at peace with your surroundings uh, and ensuring that the places in which you live are wholesome. And that feeds into the, the whole care of creation agenda as well. Um, I also think that monastic communities are very good spaces for um, ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. Um, I remember many years ago when I was a student at Wanosh, we, we did a retreat at Quar Abbey. And while we were, we were, there was my year group went there for a retreat one year down there on the Isle of Wight, not very far from where Adam is at the moment. And um, uh, while we were staying there, a, a bunch of Buddhist monks pitched up. And the monastic community had no problem in welcoming them in for a visit because they were all monastics. And that monastic experience, although very different, actually took quite a lot of boundaries away. Um, and I know Della, for instance, is there with her backdrop of 
of Tabga. Um, I have a very dear friend who's a nun at at um, at Abu Ghosh, and um, uh, uh, she, um, you know, that's a monastic community where they do a lot to bring dialogue about between uh, the Christian, Jewish, and 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 the and the Palestinian communities. So, and that's possible because it's a monastic house. Um, people find it a non-threatening space. So I think there's there's a lot there uh, growing out of the the Benedictine way um, that is very that is absolutely hits the nail on the head uh, for a lot of our young people. Um, and I also think that you know I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that. One of the things that struck me at Pluscadon was that, that little bit of rigor. Um, and that's something actually which appeals to young people. There's that sense of challenge. There's something here to get a grip on, um, you know, uh, something but quite clear, a little bit of structure, um, not in an overbearing way. But um, I think that too. It's a great help. So I think it's a, there's an awful lot in the rule for that. I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. Adam Thank knows you. I can go on and on <laughs> and on. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Richard. Thank you. We, uh, we have a question. A question from Richard. Richard Watts. Um, yes, Bishop, Bishop Richard. I think you might have slightly Hello. answered the question I was going to ask in what you just said. I was thinking about how much the radical lifestyle that you saw at Pleskaden was part of the attraction. I mean, I was trying to balance in my own mind this thing about balanced life with the attraction of the radical lifestyle. And I was also thinking of Thomas Merton's journey and how he was very attracted by the radical lifestyle of the, the Trappists uh, at Gethsemane. And then <laughs> there wasn't much balanced in, my, in part of that lifestyle. It was very rigorous. And uh, I, I was also reflecting on, um, for you, how much do you think is it's important to have that radical edge to attract young people? But I think you slightly answered that in what you just said. If you've any more to say on that, I've been- well, Just a little bit. I mean, I think, I think balance happens in different ways. So you can say, um, the monastic life in a in a monastery like Pluscadon is the balance lies between prayer, work, sleep, uh, and it's the it's pretty much the same amount. Well, a bit less for sleep, but it's pretty much the same. Not far off across those three things. So there is balance. It's just expressed in a way that to some people in the very busy world might be a little bit. I don't think it's scary. I think a little curious to begin with until you realize why it's there. Mm. Um, for some people in our society, looking at parish life when it's lived at its best, people might find, well, that's a bit radical. You know, some people would say, oh, I've got to get up on Sunday morning, go to church. That's a bit radical. We wouldn't think that at all. It kind of depends where you're coming from. Um, but I, I, I think, I, I'm not sure radical is the right word. Well, it, I mean, it's, not, it's not the wrong word, but I think what's there is, let me put it in a slightly different way. What attracts is simplicity and clarity. I think simplicity and clarity. Um, now, simplicity for some looks like a heck of a lot of rigour. But really, it's simplicity, if that makes sense. Yes, that does make a lot of sense. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Well, um, we don't seem to have any more questions stacked up, and we are at uh, um, 8.59, so um, I might pass back at this moment to Adam to see if he's got anything else he would like to say. I'd just like to say very much a big thank you to you, Bishop Richard, for uh, a very fascinating talk and some um, very um, compelling questions as well. Thank you. Oh, it's lovely to be with you. Thank you, Michael.
So um, just a few words to finish off. Thank you so much, Bishop Richard, for coming to talk to us. Um, it was a bit of a loaded question when I asked if you felt that it had impacted on your life as a bishop, obviously being one of your flock. Um, I, I can say uh, that your, your Benedictine uh, spirit came across loud and clear right from the beginning and has been a wonderful gift, I think, to our diocese. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, you will leave behind, um, hopefully not for some years, but um, you will leave behind um, this, uh, the love of simplicity and of beautiful liturgy, uh, but also very concretely with this Lexio Divina, which has been so much part of, of, of our experience with you as Bishop. So I just um, wanted to give you that little bit of feedback as well after asking you that very loaded question. Um, and um, I think that um, one of the most important chapters of the rule is about uh, humility. And when I spoke to Bishop Richard originally and he said it today, he said, you know, really, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not as good as the previous speakers you've had. Well, I think that uh, tonight you've proven that you really have opened up to us um, something which um, I don't think we've had with the other speakers, which is just how you have lived your Benedictine life uh, as an oblate. And for us, that is so interesting uh, because we're all trying to live our lives as lay Benedictines. And so to hear you talking about things like reading the rule every day um, and your own um, attention to the scriptures and your beautiful interpretation of the rule, which really struck home with me when you talked about it making, um, let's say, our faith accessible to all people, that it's, it, it, it is full of humanity. And I it was really appreciated the way that you said that, because uh, I think that for all of us, maybe that's part of the attraction is that we all know we're, we are um, weak vessels trying our best and it's um, that Benedict is a good place for us to go to when we feel like that. So in any case, uh, for all those reasons, I would just like us as a community uh, to thank you very much uh, for, for your support to this community uh, and for coming tonight and talking to us and giving us this story of your personal uh, journey with St. Benedict. So thank you very much, Bishop Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think you deserve a rest now, Bishop Richard. <laughs> <laughs>